The Israelite temple in Jerusalem has fueled the imagination for millennia. Thought of as the Axis Mundi, or the navel of the world as it appears on midi medieval maps, the site of the Beit HaMikdash was conceived by the ancient Israelites as being the very home of their God on earth. Built as a permanent dwelling following the mobile shrine or the Mishkan, first by King Solomon, then rebuilt by Zerubbabel before a final grand reconstruction by King Herod, the temple is even thought to herald the final apocalyptic days where a third temple serves variously in the Abrahamic eschatologies. From the site of the Ark of the Covenant to the last earthly days of Jesus of Nazareth, the first direction of prayer for Muslims, the architecture of the Templars and the Freemasons, to the latter sacred buildings of the Latter-day Saints, the Jerusalem Temple has served both in theory and practice as a singular site of sanctity. But what do we actually know about the services or avodah performed in the temple? In this episode, I want to explore just that question by going into some detail about the elaborate rituals performed in the temple on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the holiest day in the Israelite calendar. Indeed, Yom Kippur, as Steinsaltz has pointed out, is triply holy. It is the holiest time, Yom Kippur, performed by the holiest person, the Kohen HaGadol, the high priest, by entering into the holiest place, the Kadosh Kadoshim, the Holy of Holies. What did this triply holy ritual look like during the days of the Jerusalem Temple. Let's explore just that complex set of rituals. If you're interested in ancient rituals, mystery religions, or the history of the occult, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics in esotericism. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube, I'd hope that you consider supporting my work on Patreon, or with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and I really do appreciate your consideration of supporting the channel. Also, if you want to learn how Yom Kippur is practiced in modern times by Jews long since the destruction of the temple, make sure to check out Religion for Breakfast's episode on just that topic in the card above. I've been a huge fan of Andrew's work, and it actually is an inspiration that helped me to start this channel, Esoterica. So I really want to express my thanks to Religion for Breakfast for providing so much great religious studies content, and also for their great episode on Yom Kippur. Now, let's turn to the triply sacred avodah, or worship, in the ancient Jerusalem temple. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Despite the fame of the Jerusalem Temple, very little popular attention is paid to the daily avodah, or worship, that occurred within its precincts. This isn't terribly surprising, it's an utterly foreign world to our modern sensibilities. Indeed, as a content warning, this episode is going to frequently make mention of animal blood sacrifices from a historical and academic perspective. Despite being extremely complicated and frankly shocking to modern sensibilities, the service within the Jerusalem Temple was at the center of much of Israelite life. Further, temple worship remains one of the best documented religious rituals of the ancient world. We still have very little idea of what went on within the temples of ancient Egypt, Babylon, Greece, or Rome. 
These traditions seem to have been largely oral and were con conducted from priest to priest without ever really seeming to have been written down. Indeed, they were often very carefully guarded secrets and the conduct of the mystery religions, such as the rites of Eleusis or Mithras, are even more obscure. The situation with the worship in the Jerusalem temple is oddly well spelled out, though by no means simple. Why? Cultural genocide. After a series of rebellions against Roman colonial rule, the Jerusalem temple was destroyed and mass pogroms were carried out against the indigenous Jewish population, such that the religious authorities of the time felt that Judaism itself was facing an existential threat. Given that threat, they decided to commit to writing, which was up to that point only transmitted orally. This collection of oral traditions and debates became known as the Mishnah and was redacted sometime around 200 of the Common Era. Two later series of commentaries on this text were also composed and are themselves the famed Jerusalem or Palestinian and Babylonian Talmuds. We're going to be turning primarily to Tractate Yoma in the Mishnah, which details the Yom Kippur ritual in the temple. Indeed, some of that text seems to have been composed by people with a living memory of having served in the temple before it was destroyed by the Romans. Now, that doesn't mean that the text is perfect, and even within the pages of Tractate Yoma, there are serious debates about just how many things were to be performed. Even the order of certain sacrifices, which were key to the rituals of that day, aren't totally agreed upon, but we're going to go through the whole day reconstructing the ritual service of the high priest given with what appears to be the most general shared consensus in pointing out at least some of these technical aspects of the debates about the performance of the Avodah. Yom Kippur itself has a very complex origin and is likely at least three different religious rituals combined. A purification ritual for the high priest for entering into the Holy of Holies to commune with the Israelite God, perhaps in an altered state of consciousness or shamanic trance. A general day of atonement for the sins of the collective nation of Israel and a ritual whereby those sins are transferred to an animal, here a goat as we'll see, and that animal is dispatched. All three of these rituals are actually known from other ancient Near East cultures, though by the composition of the Torah in the 5th century BCE, they seem to have been combined into one day of extreme sanctity and awe. Here we're going to be focusing in on how the Yom Kippur rituals would have been carried out sometime in the mid first century of the Common Era, around the time of the life and death of Jesus of Nazareth and the high priesthood of Hanan ben Hanan, the high priest on the eve of the Great Revolt. Again, while exact details may escape us, let's begin about a week before that holiest day of Yom Kippur. Seven days prior to Yom Kippur, the high priest or the Kohen HaGadol is sequestered to the temple chambers from his family in order to ensure his absolute ritual purity. A deputy high priest is also selected to serve in the case that the actual high priest should die or somehow become otherwise ritually unfit. Even a spare wife is selected for the high priest in case his actual wife should die. Why? He's commanded in the Torah to atone for his entire family and must have a wife to complete that family unit. Thus, if his current wife dies, he'll be quickly remarried to complete the ritual atonement. Further, he's sprinkled with the ashes of the sacrificial red heifer to remove any trace of ritual impurity and begins to rehearse the acrobatics required for the incense offerings in the Holy of Holies. And he also reviews the various ritual procedures expected of him of that day. 
One can't underestimate the stakes here. The entire fate of the relationship between the Israelites and their God at some level depends on his performance of this series of rituals. No pressure or anything. He also inspects the various animals that will be sacrificed that day, with the exception of the sin-bearing goats. And he performs some light ritual duties in the temple that week as a kind of warm-up for the big day. He's further instructed on the central debate of that time period. When is the incense of the Holy of Holies lit, inside or outside the Holy of Holies? We'll come back to that in a moment, but it's a crucial matter of contention. And given that it's literally how the Israelite God manifests to the high priests, this is no trivial matter. In order to prevent the possibility of any kind of ritually invalidating nocturnal emission, the high priest's diet is restricted the night before the Yom Kippur fast, and he's kept awake all night long, thus prolonging the experience of the 25-hour fast that all capable Israelites must undergo as they endure Inui Nefesh, or they afflict their souls. Various scriptures are read to him, fingers are snapped if he dozes off, and he paces about barefoot on the cold floor of the temple to keep himself alert through the night. At midnight, the ashes from the previous day's sacrifices are cleared from the massive altar, the first difference between Yom Kippur and virtually all other days of the year. This sacrificial altar, or the Mizbeach, is truly titanic. 10 meters or 32 feet tall, reached by a ramp, and 16 meters or 52 and a half feet square atop. As dawn approaches, the temple courtyard is already filling to standing room capacity. From the roof of the temple, priests are looking east for dawn to break, and with the first major illumination, the spotter cries out, Barkai. And with the illumination of the dawn having reached as far as Hebron, the tomb of the patriarchs having also been built by Herod and architecturally similar to the temple, the day has come and the first sacrifices begin. The high priest has over 40 distinct ritual tasks to complete before the sun sinks in the west and the clock has started ticking. The Kohen HaGadol undresses himself and ritually immerses in the mikvah, the first of five immersions, and changes then into the first set of the golden garments, the first of five garment changes for the day. The golden garments are the usual ritual attire of the high priest during the rest of the year and will be worn while he performs the first tamid, or continual sacrifice, commanded for every day of the year, Yom Kippur or not. Though usually performed by regular priests, today it will be formed by the Kohen HaGadol. This morning tamid sacrifice includes a lamb along with grain mixed with oil, a libation offering, and the first steps for preparing the enormous golden menorah, which will be lit at the conclusion of the day. Another identical tamid offering will occur later in the afternoon as well. This daily sacrifice completed, the high priest immerses in the mikveh again and changes into the special linen garments for Yom Kippur. Before and after each change of these garments, an additional hand and foot washing is required, thus resulting in 10 such washings throughout the day. These linen garments were extremely valuable, being procured as far away as Egypt and India. The Mishnah actually notes that both sets of these linen garments were worth as much as 18 maneh, or somewhere in the neighborhood of about 280 troy ounces of silver. That's roughly $7,000 in U.S. money in the fall of 2021 for two linen garments. Now in the linen garments, the high priest approaches the first major Yom Kippur offering, the bull. He places both hands between the bull's eyes and confesses his sins and the sins of his family. During this confession and the other two confessions of the day, he utters the full pronunciation of the divine name spelled Yod-Heh-Vav-Heh, 
the first of three such pronunciations that day, and the only time in the Israelite year where the ineffable four-letter name of the Israelite God is vocalized as it is written. This is also the first major recurring miracle of the day. Hearing the divine name pronounced, the entire population of the temple falls completely prostrate. Recall that it's standing room only. The Talmud relates how the temple itself stretched in all directions, miraculously warping space itself to accommodate the communal act of prostration at hearing the divine name. After reciting this confession, the high priest makes his way to the enormous central entrance to the Hechal, or the holy place, the east-facing Nicanor Gate. This gate is also an important landmark in the temple given the miracle story attached to it. Nicanor had the giant two-door copper gate made in Alexandria, and taking them back by sea, a terrible storm is said to have befallen the ship. In desperation, the sailors threw one of the copper doors into the sea, and in horror, Nicanor lashed himself to the other door and threatened that they would have to cast him into the sea as well, just as the other door. Just then, the storm abated and the sea calmed. Arriving at the port of Akko, Nicanor was despondent until the other enormous solid copper door was found to have washed up right beside the cargo ship, somehow miraculously floating along the ship the entire time. While the other gates of the temple were golden, the copper gates of the Nicanor gate were never replaced given the miracle of their survival. Here, the high priest is flanked by attendants and his deputy, and they stand in front of a golden box to draw one of two lots for two goats. One lot reads for Adonai, for Hashem, the Israelite God, and the other reads for Azazel, perhaps an ancient wilderness demon. One goat will be sacrificed in the temple that day, and the other, the one for Azazel, bearing the sins of the entire people of Israel, the famed scapegoat, will be led a dozen or so miles into the Judean wilderness and cast down a mountain, tearing it to shreds. With the lot selected, the goat for Adonai, or Shem, is selected, and a second confession is made by the high priest on behalf of the priestly cast over the bull from earlier. Again, the ineffable name of God is pronounced and the entire congregation falls to their face in worship as the bull is slaughtered and its blood captured in a basin. The goat for Azazel has a red string attached to its horns and is led away to be released later. The high priest now ascends the giant altar or mizbeach in preparation for the most physically complex aspect of the day's ceremonies. Using a golden shovel, he takes some of the inner portion of the hottest coals and must then collect two handfuls of incense. This is difficult because both hands must hold the incense while the shovel of hot coals must be either held in the teeth or under the armpit without any of the coals being dropped in the next crucial journey. With the incense and the hot coals collected, he now walks down the ramp and enters into the interior sanctuary, the Hechal, carrying incense and balancing the coals as he performs the most dangerous duty of the day. Entering and offering the incense within the Kadosh Kadoshim, the Holy of Holies. This is also the thorniest debate of ancient Judaism, where the incense is to be lit. The Sadducees held that it should be lit outside of the Holy of Holies and taken within, whereas the Pharisees held that it should be lit within the Holy of Holies, and depending on the high priest, either could be performed based on their interpretation of one line of the Torah in Leviticus. Of course, this was a bitter dispute because the entire atonement for the people of Israel at some level depended on performing this task correctly, and any mistake could mean a deep spiritual failure and even the divine execution of the high priest. Regardless, let's assume a Pharisee interpretation for this high priest's 
unlike someone like Hanan bin Hanan, who we mentioned earlier, who was, in fact, a Sadducee. The great curtains or parochet separating the Hechal from the most holy place were pinned up such that the high priest would enter on the left or south, he would turn right or north, and then pass into the Holy of Holies by turning left or west. The gap between the curtains being only a cubit or about 18 inches wide. Once within the Holy of Holies, now bereft of the Ark of the Covenant since the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians, the high priest enters a golden walled room with a rock outcropping emerging from the floor called the Evan Hashtia, or the foundation stone, which is about three fingers breadth from the ground. This is in all likelihood the same rock seen today in the Dome of the Rock and known to Muslims as the Noble Rock. He would place the coal pan down and ignite the incense, whose secret formula was long held by the Avtinas family, before briefly, briefly uttering a prayer as the room began to fill with the aromatic smoke of the incense. When the Ark was present, the incense was actually placed between the carrying rails of the Ark. It's also said that a rope was sometimes attached to his leg, such that if he tarried, he could be dragged out of the Holy of Holies as if he had perhaps been struck down by divine wrath. With the incense offering made, he exits the way that he entered, walking backwards in reverence. This is the first of four visitations to the Holy of Holies throughout the day of Yom Kippur. The high priest returns to the Hechal, or holy place. He takes up the basin of bull's blood, which has a, an official stir to prevent it from coagulating, and he re-enters the Holy of Holies to sprinkle the blood in a whipping motion eight times, once upwards and seven times downwards. Once complete, he returns to the Nicanor gate. He slaughters the goat for Adonai, and he catches its blood in another basin. He returns to the Holy of Holies a third time and sprinkles the goat's blood just in the same way as he did the bull's blood. He exits and then he proceeds to sprinkle the blood of the bull and then the blood of the goat in turn onto the outer curtain or parochet before pouring the remaining bull's blood in with the goat's blood. Coming to the gold-plated inner altar in the Hechal, he smears the combined blood on the four horns of the inner altar, starting with the northeastern corner, and then again sprinkles the altar eight times in a whipping motion. Leaving the Hechal, he makes his way to the east of the Azara near the Nicanor Gate, and makes a final confession on behalf of all the people of Israel onto the goat marked for Azazel. For the third and final time, the holy name of God is pronounced. The congregation falls again in worshipful prostration, and the goat for Azazel begins its long, doomed journey into the Judean wilderness. The heat of the day could weaken the goat, so there are ten way stations with food and water for it. Simply escorting the goat, this was rarely performed by an Israelite, for Azazel renders one so ritually impure that even one's clothes become invalid, and the escorts must remain in the way station until the end of the Yom Kippur ceremonies. While the goat is making its journey, the entrails and limbs of the previous sacrifices are prepared for incineration. A series of relay flags from the wilderness commutes that the goat for Azazel has been thrown backwards off the mountain, basically to prevent it from coming back with all the sins that have been transferred to it, and at that moment the previous bull and goat for Hashem are incinerated. This marks a moment where the mood in the crowd shifts from pensive expectation to ecstatic joy. Atonement for Israel has truly begun in earnest. In some legends, a red cord visible to the crowd also miraculously turned white at this very moment. Surely, the high priest breathes a sigh of relief, though the delirium of hunger as the heat of the day comes into full effect in the shining marble of the temple. 
Once the incineration has begun, the high priest makes his way through the Nicanor Gate for the first time today and reads aloud and recites from memory the specific Torah sections detailing the divinely ordained worship for Yom Kippur. With the reading complete, another garment change takes place from the linen into a second set of golden garments with both a ritual immersion in the mikvah and two hand and foot washings accompanying. Coming to the north side of the large altar or mizbeach, the high priest slaughters two further rams, gathers their blood, and sprinkles it onto the northeast and southwest corners of the enormous mizbeach. The rams are further butchered, entirely incinerated, and around now the second tamid offering and the musaf offering also become possible and there is a lot of debate in the Mishnah about exactly their timing. Regardless, another garment change takes place from the golden garments into another set of linen garments with the accompanying ritual immersions and hand and foot washings. The high priest now enters the Kadosh Kadoshim, the Holy of Holies, for the final time of the year, removing the incense followed by another garment change back into the golden garments. Now he may complete the afternoon or evening tamid offering, which is the way the day started, before a final tenth washing of the hands and feet. And by now the sun has sunk in the west and eyes are turning to the sky looking for three shining stars that will signal the completion of the tenth of Tishrei and the end of Yom Kippur. As night descends, the high priest will light the grand golden menorah, marking the end of the day, and then he will return home and end his fast by breaking bread with a great festivity with his friends and family. Of course, the sacrifices aren't over. They'll begin again the next morning, though he won't be the centerpiece of the ritual procedures. The Avodah, or worship performed by the high priest in the Temple of Jerusalem, was perhaps one of the most complex set of rituals known to us from the ancient world. It was meant to intercede on behalf of the high priest, the priestly caste, and the entire population of Israel to atone for their sins and renew their covenantal relationship with their God as stipulated in the Torah. Thus, it's no wonder it was one of the most profound, awe-inspiring, and ecstatic rituals in the yearly cycle of Israelite life. And while it hasn't been observed now in nearly 2,000 years, the basic structure is retained in the cycle of prayers uttered by Jews on Yom Kippur with prayers offered in the stead of sacrifices. The observance of Yom Kippur today is still an echo of those ancient sacrifices, garments, and the ritual purifications in the hopes of atonement for personal and collective sin. Of course, I haven't gone into every detail of this elaborate ancient ritual or the extensive debates on the details, both large and small, found both in the Mishnah and the Talmud. If you really want to dive into these questions, I would do it the same way that I did preparing for this episode by carefully studying Tractate Yoma of the Mishnah, along with the Gemara, if you really want to be hardcore. You can find both of these texts online at Sepharia. I'll have links below for them where you can study them both in Hebrew, Aramaic, and in English. Further, a great text to learn about the general history of the temple is the Hambali and Seely illustrated Solomon's Temple Myth and History. Of course, the literature on the temple is absolutely vast, and I can't possibly cover all of it here. Again, if you want to learn more about how Yom Kippur developed following the destruction of the temple and how it's observed now, make sure to check out the episode over at Religion for Breakfast. Make sure to tell Andrew I said hi. Until next time, here's to wishing everybody a wonderful Jewish New Year. May 5782, the current Jewish year, be a year for blessing, and may we all strive to become more thoughtful and caring people, atoning for where we fall short and thriving to become the best version of ourselves.
Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.